relating to environmental rule of law, specifically here in the region. Uh, IUCN, uh, for those of you who may be interested, has long been engaged in environmental law globally and here in the region, uh, including through the work that has been done by the World Commission on Environmental Law and also uh, our own Pacific Center for Environmental Governance, based right out of this office here in Suva, Fiji. Uh, we actively uh, support the growing reform uh, in environmental law in the region and in the world uh, that is led by the UN via the Global PAC uh, for the Environment and also through the IUCN World Declaration on the Environment uh, Rule of Law, which uh, outlines 13 principles for developing and implementing solutions for ecologically sustainable development right across the globe. Colleagues, as you know, uh, the Pacific Island countries have been um, developing and improving their own environmental law, some dating back from the 1960s. But uh, with limited resources and expertise, this uh, no doubt creates a challenge as they seek to implement, monitor, and enforce national environment policy, legislation, and uh, regulations. Therefore, this uh, series and through the uh, IUCN Environmental Law Brown Bag Launch Series and the upcoming Oceania Law Conference uh, can be designated as part of IUCN sport to advance environmental law and its benefits uh, so that it can deliver to the people and to nature in the region uh, an improved environmental law uh, system. So on behalf of the IUCN team, I welcome you again to this first uh, of many sessions, and I look forward to the discussions uh, in the room and virtually today. Thank you, and Vina uh, Kavakalebu. Thank you, Mason, for, for that wonderful opening remarks. Um, we have some housekeeping uh, matters that we need to discuss with you before we uh, begin. Um, for those in the, in the room, please don't connect to the link, to the Zoom link with your phones or your laptops, so we avoid any interference. If you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to use the chat box. For those of you that are in the room, please write down your questions and... Um, and you can ask, uh, or you can ask the speakers directly. We will allow you to do that. If you do not want to do that, uh, you can write it down, hand over the questions to me, and I'll hand it over to Akanisi, who's moderating that section, session. In terms of accreditation for continuing legal education for all the lawyers that are connecting with us today and are here with us, um, this uh, CLE is not, a, uh, this seminar is not accredited yet by the board, uh, but be rest assured that we have written to the Board of Legal Education seeking for accreditation uh, and we are yet to hear from them. So once we do, we will inform you, but you can, um, you can let us know uh, if you are interested in, in getting the points. Um, so we're gonna move on. I, I'll, my co-moderator is Akanisi Vaka Waletambua, who is a lawyer and educator, having taught at the Fiji National University and uh, recently the University of the South Pacific, both here in Suva, Fiji, driven by the need to raise the capacity of law graduates to be skilled researchers and critical thinkers. Akanisi is a strong believer in being grounded in sound theory, as well as relevant and best practice. In addition to teaching, Akanisi was a lawyer for Howard's Lawyers in Suva, working in the area of environmental law, commercial law, and civil litigation. She was also senior legal counsel for Digicel Pacific, a regional uh, telecommunications company in which 
she helped to provide legal services to five uh, Pacific countries it operated in. Akanisi is a law, management, and international um, relations graduate from the University of Waikato, and also obtained her MSc in international public policy from UCL London as a recipient of the esteemed UK Chivening Scholarship. Akanisi will be taking over the session and will introduce the speakers to you. Vinaka. Uh, as mentioned earlier in the kind introduction, my name is Akanisi, and as a co-moderator of this panel, I'd like to reiterate the words of welcome shared uh, by Mr. Mason Smith, and also thank IUCN for providing this space, time, and resources in hosting this panel, and the audience here, and also those joining us on Zoom in the first of a series of important conversations. Um, just a few minor housekeeping to add to the other housekeeping. Um, this session is recorded and presentations and links will also be made available by the support team for this series, just in case you're going to furiously be writing notes. Uh, please hold your questions till the Q&A session after the final speaker. Uh, when you do ask a question, please state your name and what organization you represent or where you are joining us from and who you are directing, directing the question to. If you are online, you're most welcome to send in a message to us um, as earlier stated by Maria. And if you'd like to share a comment or share an experience, you're also welcome to do so in the Q&A session. But we again ask that you keep it short and succinct to allow the members of the panel to also answer succinctly. Um, so Albert Einstein once said, we cannot solve our we created them. I would not be speaking out of turn if I were to be so bold to add that we cannot also solve our problems on our own. Uh, however, self-isolation due to COVID-19, closed borders and lockdowns have compounded the silos and echo chambers uh, we sit in, especially in a time when issues concerning the environment require collaboration and innovation. It was with this that the, uh, it was with this challenge that this brown bag lunch series was born uh, with the great support of IUCN, the panel and of course the audience here today. At the heart of these um, conversations, there's a need to ensure that um, talking is happening, experiences are shared and networks are being made. And should it spark a research question or papers, submissions or contribute to a report or policy document, even grow networks outside of our silos, then we are all the better for it. Um, our topic today, as you know, um, as is common knowledge, the Pacific are low emitters of carbon, but along with Asia are the, some of the hardest hit by climate change, by climate change. So pursuant to our common law and statutes, um, environmental litigation is often presented as disputes relating to forestry, water rights, pollution, urban planning, and environmental permits. And so on. Within this growing area of law are common and unique challenges that our panel will share today. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, but it is my task at this juncture to introduce our panel of speakers today. And <clears throat> though my introductions are quite brief, please know that it is due to time constraints only and is in no way a reflection of the wealth of knowledge and experience that the speakers bring to the table in the area of environmental litigation. Our first speaker joining us is Bryony Eels, who is a climate change and environmental lawyer working in the Asian Development Bank's Law and Policy Reform Program. She has spent the last few years leading detailed research into climate change law, policy, and litigation in Asia and the Pacific. ADB will publish the results as a four-part report series, Climate Change Coming Soon to a Court Near You. The reports discuss climate science, Asian and Pacific climate lit litigation, and regional and international climate law and policy. In her work with ADB, Ms. Eels also supports a Southeast Asia government with its climate law and climate change strategy update. 
Our second speaker joining us from Papua New Guinea is Justice M. Bang Kandakasi, who was appointed Deputy Chief Justice of the Supreme and National Courts of Justice of Papua New Guinea on the 13th of December, 2018. He was appointed a Justice of the same courts in 2000. Aside from obtaining his under and postgraduate degrees in law from the University of PNG and San Diego respectively, his honor is also accredited as a mediator in Australia, New Zealand, and PNG. And before his judicial appointment, was a partner of the firm Young and Williams Lawyers and taught law at the University of PNG. He currently chairs the PNG Judiciary's ADR Committee, overseeing the development and successful implementation of court annexed mediation and ADR in PNG, having achieved some major successes along the way. Justice M. Bang has always had a passion for continuing legal, judicial mediation and ADR education locally and internationally, and is acti actively involved in training in, in these fields. Amongst his trainees have been judges, magistrates, senior government officials, business leaders, lawyers, and other professionals in the Solomon Islands, Australia, Fiji, Malaysia, and PNG. He has attended and facilitated a number of local and international workshops, published in a number of, ju a number of judgments on mediation and ADR, several papers at international and local conferences, and journals in the areas of mediation, ADR, and human rights. He continues to be the Vice President of the Perth-based Asia-Pacific Mediation Forum. Welcome, Justice Ermbang. Our third speaker on the panel is Mr. Nicholas Barnes, who is the Managing Partner for Munro Lees, uh, which is Fiji's largest law firm with a legal career, and I couldn't believe this myself, spanning 30 years of legal experience. Mr. Barnes has practiced law in England, Wales, Tuvalu, Fiji, New Zealand and Grenada. In his career, he has spent 17 years practicing in Fiji, primarily as a litigator in various areas, including environmental law and ADR. His regional experience includes being the former people's lawyer of Tuvalu and providing advice in PNG. He is a former vice chair of the Fiji Environmental Law Association. In another life, Nick was in an in-house counsel for Greenpeace UK and helped bring a number of judicial review claims against the UK government, as well as assisting activists defend criminal claims arising out of direct actions. Nick remarks that, that as far as environmental law is concerned, he would describe himself as a cynical optimist, a, sen a sentiment sometimes um, that I confess to sharing also. So without further ado, I'd like to invite our first speaker, Ms. Briny Eels. Hi everyone, thank you for having me. I will share my screen. Okay, so as, uh, as Akanas, Akanisi mentioned, I'm an environmental and climate change lawyer. I work in the Asian Development Bank's law policy and reform program. And for the past decade, we have spent time working with judiciaries and courts on environmental law and recently climate change. So we have helped set up specialized courts. We've helped with things like environmental rules of procedure. And late last year, we published a series of reports on climate law and sustainable development law. So they're actually up and they're available. And if you are interested, they are on the ADB website and they look at law, policy, climate science, actually um, specifically in Asia and the Pacific because we need to start talking about regional jurisprudence and law. Did you mute it? Am I on mute? <laughs> Everyone can hear me okay? Okay. okay. Uh, so looking at some of the, and the reason I mentioned, just going back here, the reason I mentioned climate change is, as Akin, Akinisi mentioned, in 2021, we can't be talking about environmental law and litigation without climate change. I mean, it's, it's, they're integrally connected. So looking at some of the challenges that I see, I recognize that I'm not 
you know, from the Pacific, but I've done a lot of work looking at Asia and the Pacific. Some of the issues that have come up in the work that we've done are, are obviously things like access to justice. Uh, standing is a critical component of that, but I'll, I'd like to discuss it separately. And then just the, the business of, of actually how you go about litigating environmental and climate change law matters. So turning to access to justice, Late last year, ADB had a conference. Uh, Maria was actually involved in the conference and we did a breakaway group. And we looked at some of the issues around access to justice in the time of COVID. And actually we were really surprised because what came up is that people are less concerned about COVID from an as access to justice perspective and more concerned about some of the broader issues for access to justice. So in the Pacific, things like small and re remote communities having difficulty accessing either environmental law experts or having access to legal information and resources. And the access to legal information and resources is one of the reasons why ADB is sharing knowledge because we recognize that it's hard to get information about uh, some laws and, and litigation in, in one place. So we consolidated them. We also looked at Sorry, half of my screen is gone, so I just had to see. Uh, access to courts. As I mentioned previously, ADB has worked with courts on things like environmental rules of procedure. It can be very difficult for litigants to pursue matters uh, in courts that apply um, old fashioned threshold tests for environmental litigation and also hard where you don't have lower cost proceedings. Uh, Often judges have studied 20 or 30 years ago. They're very busy. They may not have a specialized environmental practice. So it can be really challenging for them as well. And that creates an access to court issue. In the Pacific, an issue was raised around holding foreign companies liable for environmental damage, specifically those companies that in, involved in natural resource exploitation, mining, forestry. That is an issue in terms of how do you have the rules of procedure that allow those matters to proceed? And how do you actually bring those multinational corporations involved and get them and make them liable and assure that accountability? And then transnational litigation. One of the features that we found in the Pacific is that uh, many, um, many litigants in the Pacific who are looking at um, issues around climate migration are more likely to pursue governments outside of the Pacific, there's a general recognition that the Pacific obviously has not contributed to climate change as an issue. And so people are looking at, well, you know, if we didn't cause this issue and we need, issue, we need assistance and funding with adaptation, how do we get that? And, and what are the, the avenues that we can use to sue for that? Public interest litigation, I wanted to talk about the threshold issues for public interest litigation in environmental cases. So many of the environmental cases that I saw coming up in the Pacific when we were looking at our, doing our research, a lot around torts of nuisance or negligence, not so many around broader issues around environmental rights or, or rights to life. And these types of cases can be really useful for people when you are concerned about an environmental impact and you are not directly someone who's aggrieved. So uh, you're aggrieved simply because you're a citizen of, of a country. So we found in other jurisdictions across Asia have been more aggressive or more active in uh, pursuing um, public interest litigation on constitutional rights. So constitutional rights to life or constitutional rights to environment. And I've just given three cases here where the courts have relaxed the threshold for standing and they've done that on this notion of rights where environment is a, is a common property. There's a public interest in environmental preservation or under the constitution, people have a right to a balanced and healthful ecology um, or where the constitution is um, violated then anyone who is a citizen has a right to pursue that. So that's a, it's a useful set of cases or a useful uh, body of law to know about if that's a particular angle that you would be running in the Pacific. 
Uh, we have wonderful new jurisprudence from Justice, Justice Mbeng Kandakasi, who will be speaking after me, and I won't go into this in too much detail, Marua and China Harbour Engineering Company, PNG Limited. So plaintiffs suing over a bridge redevelopment that proceeded without the appropriate permits. Uh, and Justice Kandakasi spent time looking at the constitutional right to a healthy environment in PNG and whether that would have whether that was relevant in a standing context and I'll let him discuss that. I've also, also shared this case of Kiel and Minister of Natural Resources. It is a judicial review decision and so the court discusses very briefly what the aggrieved person test is in that context and so there's some cases to know about. Uh, looking at some of the challenges for environmental law generally and climate law and we discussed this in our reports. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned before, access to laws can be a challenge. So, and that can be a challenge also with new climate change frameworks. In the countries that we surveyed, surveyed across Asia and the Pacific, only 25% had a, an economy-wide institutional framework law that explained either targets or who was responsible for what. So if you don't have that law, and often we see that in the environmental space, it kind of makes it hard to know who is responsible for what and what the obligations are and what your rights are. And so that's why when we see gaps in laws, people using rights-based litigation because they can pull in a constitutional right for their case. Environmental impact assessments across the region from a climate change perspective, often look at whether a project impacts climate change, but not the reverse. So that affects resilience. It means that if we're not looking at how a project is impacted by climate change over the next 50 years, you may not have environmentally resilient infrastructure. And so that's why I've also mentioned strengthening adaptation laws, because there's still an emphasis on disaster risk reduction, but not necessarily as much policy or as much lawmaking around strengthening adaptation laws and building resilience. I've also mentioned uh, oceans. The Pacific is defined by the ocean. I mean, I'm not from the Pacific, but I see cultures talking about what the ocean means. And many uh, Pacific nations in their nationally determined contributions talk about environmental protection and blue carbon, but the legal frameworks are still catching up. Uh, and speaking of catching up, we also see that Technology is moving really fast. So in the areas of energy, we still need to see legal frameworks that are flexible enough to allow and support adaptation of new technology. Courts also are getting better at uh, incorporating um, international obligations and scientific consensus. So that's useful again in a climate in change context or a rights-based case well, you might be looking at your country has signed a treaty and that treaty is based on scientific principles. So how do you incorporate that in, in your jurisprudence? There's also still a need for carbon pricing. And I mentioned these gaps because I make the point in, in our report series that often gaps tell us where litigation might come from because people need to fill these gaps. So you can use, uh, potentially look at, um, uh, rights-based litigation to fill some of these gaps. I just quickly have given you a screenshot of our climate change, uh, one of our reports. It's on the national climate change legal frameworks in Asia and the Pacific. So we look at some of these gaps, we look at national legal and policy frameworks, but we also give a constitutional rights survey. So that's really useful for, for this rights-based litigation to understand you know, which country has which constitutional rights and how are they relevant in an environmental law and climate change context. Re some interesting recent developments in climate litigation in the Pacific. I've raised these three cases because they're talking about fisheries. Um, the first one, Fram Hein and Attorney General Fisheries and International Obligations and also an EIA. So in this first case in the Cook Islands was about the government making a decision to increase its purse sign fishery for skipjack tuna. I hope I got that right. Um, and so the, the case disputes 
whether that was a sound decision and whether an EIA should have been undertaken in view of the country's international obligations under the uh, United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea and other agreements, as well as domestic obligations. And the court agreed that these international obligations um, meant that there was an obligation to do an environmental impact assessment and it's ordered the, the, the government to do that. So this case is a really great example of, of, of Pacific court incorporating international principles and saying, yes, that creates domestic obligations. And these second two set of cases from the Solomon Islands are about forestry. And I mention them because they are about providing significant awards of money for environmental damage. I think one of the challenges that we see in environmental law is how do you sue over a tree? How do you quantify that? What's, it's priceless, but how do we as the lawyers and judges quantify it? So I've provided those two examples of cases from the specific of courts um, making good, good quality decisions about environmental damage. They also echo uh, some great jurisprudence from Indonesia, which I cut, which we cover in our report about that based on torts of negligence and, in, and awards of damage made for deforestation and clearing of peat forests. Oh, sorry, I'm having a problem. Okay. So I, I realize that I'm, I'm coming to the end of my time and this has been a very quick survey, but I really just wanted to stress the idea that environmental justice needs big ideas and it needs people who are curious about approaches from elsewhere. Um, it's, there is some a phenomenal environmental and climate jurisprudence around the world that might be relevant to your, juris, your jurisdiction. So it is there and ADB has attempted to share that. Environmental justice is served when citizens have access to courts to protect their rights. So uh, a critical component is this access to justice. How do we provide more friendly spaces for people to come to court and protect their rights? And just to remember, if you are running an environmental case, consider the climate dimensions because this is an age where we need to understand and draw the links between environmental justice and, and climate justice. And a case about deforestation is not necessarily just about trees anymore. It's about the destruction of, of carbon sinks. So have that broader perspective. And thank you very much for letting me have some time to share about our thoughts. So yeah, that's the end. I'll stop my share. <laughs> I'm just mindful of the time. Thank you, Bryony, for that presentation. Um, we'd like to move straight on to Justice Embang, if he could, for his presentation. Okay. Hello. Yeah, Hello. We can hear you. We can hear ah, you. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all. I hope I will not be long and too boring. Uh, maybe I'll pick up from uh, Bronnie's uh, presentation. I have no formal presentation to make, PowerPoint or screen to share or a paper, but that will be hopefully for Tom in the course in some, some other forum. Maybe I can pick up on the, the uh, standing issue, access to justice uh, and the need for expert independent investigation and reporting in these climate change uh, related uh, cases. And I'll speak in the context of uh, PNG. Papua New Guinea is unique in the sense that we do have section uh, 57 of our constitution which is the provision for enforcement of human rights, International Bill of Rights, which has uh, become constitutional rights. Uh, and those, uh, sorry, okay. And those Bill of Rights can be enforced by anybody. So the standing is wide open. And the test is really anyone concerned and interested in the protection of a human right or enforcement of a human right. It could be the person himself, 
It could be a judge on his own motion. It could be any other person or a rights group, uh, like the advocacy in Papua New Guinea, we had the independent uh, human rights activist uh, group that did, did their work in one case that's already reported. So in PNG, the standing issue is uh, once you come through the rights-based uh, provision, the door is wide open for indeed anybody to come. Uh, so that's the first thing on human rights. And I think the case uh, Brunley referred to is also interesting case uh, because it's one of my first judgments um, concerning human rights and enforcement and the environment uh, climate change angle. That was a case in which a Chinese company was contracted to build a bridge and the people nearby were alleging environmental damage uh, affecting their livelihoods and all of that. So I had to come to a decision on the question of standing and then whether there was a case and I'd ordered uh, everybody involved, including the um, uh, national government's climate change authority and those who are supposed to monitor activity in, in the environment and, um, and make people accountable to be joined as parties and to account for their action or inaction. The case is still alive. Uh, the relevant officers have not been uh, responding. So I'm looking at contempt and threatening some of them with imprisonment and all that is that's just coming. In the meantime, the Supreme Court of which I was sharing uh, or chairing also came to a decision reinforcing the powers the judges have to act on their own motion. They don't need to wait for anybody to start a human rights case. And in the climate space, it is a matter that affects everybody. The Supreme Court did have a survey of proper obligation of section 57, that's a human rights enforcement space, and, and picked up on my judgment, endorses that, and, then, and also says that the climate change related issues are matters that could be initiated under Section 57 by anybody. So I think that's the most important um, starting point for from the Supreme Court. Um, and then the issue of uh, um, expert independent investigation report, that's something that is needed in Papua New Guinea and I'm sure most of Pacific Island uh, countries where we do not have expertise available in number of cases that I had to deal with, and there was this issue of some environmental damage. It was pleasing to see parties taking on a suggestion for an independent investigation and report from an environmental scientific uh, expert. In the past, there's been commissioning of uh, scientists from uh, Queensland who've done a couple of uh, reports. And one case, the report uh, came out of a uh, claim for environmental damage out of a sewage uh, plant leaking out and um, leaking into the river system and affecting a lot of people. The investigation report came out saying, yes, the sewage did con um, contaminate. It was uh, releasing contaminants into the river system, but it also acknowledged some activity upstream. And upstream is, the, is a town we have called Mount Argentown is our third largest uh, city or town. And their rubbish disposal and management is horrible. You can see rubbish literally everywhere. The uh, politicians are blaming each other and they're not getting down to doing anything. So I made an order for everybody to be joined, the relevant government authorities from the national through to the local level to be joined as parties and for each of them to account for what they have done or failed to have done. And I'm reporting with some pleasure that the local authorities um, were on the paper talking about doing some cleanup. And I'm saying, I'm going to order more. In, in me, I'm saying, order more and you'll do, do what needs to be done. So we are becoming uh, proactive, but independent investigation and reporting will be a critical uh, part of uh, litigation in the climate change environment area. Another is, um, is an interesting case. I've also ordered uh, PNG Power, Papua New Guinea's PNG Power Generation uh, Company, the monopoly holder. They've been poor in generation of clean power and we have had constant disruptions affecting court and other sittings. And what I've done in that space is to order them account for the number of power, digital generated power uh, gensets throughout the country 
uh, and we need someone which we want to do a stock take of how many generators we have, how many of those are pumping out carbon monoxide into the air, and then uh, what alternative the PNG power has, why it is not getting into hydropower and clean green energy. So that's uh, something actually in the making. The case will come back before this month. I think those are enough to uh, appetize people's appetite for anything interesting to do in this space. Finally, if I could move on to the access to justice point uh, Brani made. In Papua New Guinea, the judiciary has been proactive. We are going to establish a land climate change special uh, court where all issues relating to climate change, uh, a lawyer judge experienced uh, pro those agendas to be the judge, to, to take us to a um, specialized court that can uh, bring justice in the way it should be with uh, subject speciality taking its part. But uh, added to that is a new development we're uh, implementing since March. It's called the electronic uh, integrated, sorry, integrated electronic case management system. What the system does is anybody can file any proceedings from anywhere in the country. As long as they have internet access or they could have a mobile phone and they could lodge their clients from anywhere. And uh, we believe that, um, that people can easily file. It is already happening as uh, we are speaking. So far cases filed uh, under my management now is over a thousand last year. And we are seeing about three to 4,000 already coming into the system. So uh, we believe access to justice challenges for Papua New Guinea is met by this, uh, this new system that enables anybody. You don't have to be a lawyer to file your claims. Uh, when the matter comes to court's attention, if there's need for proper pleadings and all that usual arguments lawyers come up with, that'll be a matter for direction sharing. But as to filing, as to getting a person into the court and to have his case registered and progress, uh, the system is already happening. And hopefully by the end of this year, that will become the system, court filing system for the court. No paper filing will be accepted. I um, think that's where we are at this point. The one other development that is happening is we are, in order to make that electronic filing uh, system work, we are rolling out satellites. Satellites linked up with a Pacific, Pacific network and satellites are being rolled out to improve on internet connectivity. Uh, due to the COVID, we've been able to conduct proceedings with lawyers and uh, judges all over the place. We had counsel from Brisbane appearing in the Supreme Court via video link, uh, also teleconference. When the pandemic struck and sudden took place, we, I was conducting some proceedings by teleconference. We were calling our people and I go into court, but the parties and lawyers uh, come in from from wherever they are. So I think we're doing something there, but I think that's not good enough where we need a specific collaboration and we're looking at um, spreading out and assisting uh, our struggling brothers through the PNG Center for Judicial Excellence, which is an institution the Chief Justice have agreed to, to support uh, as their vehicle for training uh, judicial officers uh, in the, to enable them in the due discharge of the duties and responsibilities. So I think I'll stop at that and um, be happy for uh, any kind of questions and comments that come this way. Thank you, Marianne, Tim. Thank you very much, uh, Justice Embang. Uh, I'd like to now invite uh, Mr. Nicholas Barnes for his presentation. Uh, hey, Bula Vanaka, everybody. I hope you can all hear me. Mm, yes. Uh, Bernie and uh, Justice Amberg, thank you very much for your presentations. Uh, Justice Amberg, I only got one thing to say in response to your presentation, and uh, wow. Can you come and help us here in Fiji, please? Uh, an open invitation to uh, come and help the Law Society make some presentations to our Chief Justice about improving our access to justice. Um, and also I should thank Maria and IECN for giving me the opportunity to talk to you all here. Uh, I think the, the first two presentations really sort of covered the, the bigger issues. So what I'm gonna try and do is just sort of bring it down to a, 
a practical level here in Fiji because all of those issues that Brianne talked about, access to justice, expertise, they all exist here in Fiji. So um, we have the same challenges. We have the challenges about expertise. We have the challenge about capacity, funding, awareness, and also conflict of interests, which I'll, I'll get to at the end of it. So um, environmental litigation in Fiji is, let me just sort of preface this. I am not, and I don't consider myself to be an environmental uh, law litigator. What I'm using here is my experience as a litigator generally, uh, and all of these issues I'm talking about are the issues that actually we all suffer from in any form of litigation or access to justice here in Fiji at the moment. So there is always this lack of expertise uh, and a lack of capacity, which I think some of the cases I'm going to show you about actually show uh, funding. I mean, litigation is expensive in just about every jurisdiction, and that's always an issue, regardless of the type of litigation you're bringing, but particularly so with environmental litigation, because it does, generally speaking, require you to get expert evidence. And then there's just a general an awareness that's within inside the population about what they're actually entitled to do and what they can do. Uh, and then, as I say, there's a bit about conflict of interests between litigants and uh, the people who are necessarily funding it and your clients. So um, I'll come back, I'll, I'll talk at a bit more detail later on. So, uh, and this is my sort of, uh, well, it's also my plug because two of the cases up here are cases I did. So there you go. I have done some environmental litigation. But also what I think I try to do, particularly to the Fiji lawyers, is, is, is don't be intimidated by the term environmental litigation. You've probably done it. You've probably been invo involved in some environmental litigation. For instance, that first case up there, Renangi Plantation, that actually, although it was in relation to the Environment Management Act, it was about access to public documents. So it was about getting an access to an EIA and convincing the uh, Department of Environment that actually an EIA was a public document that anybody was entitled to. Uh, you'd be surprised that we actually had to go to court considering it's in the legislation, but we actually had to take that matter to court. So, so that's, that's that one. The, the second part about that is, which illustrates the point that I was making about funding is, I was fortunate that I was able to bring this case because frankly, I had a client who had deep pockets and was prepared to put the money in for a, for a fight that really they didn't need to have. But as a, a public interest, they were prepared to fund that and fight that case so that we could make this point. So the funding issue is always a big, a big issue. Uh, the second case down there, that's a case that was uh, heard in the uh, Court of Appeal last year. That was done by uh, James Sloan, who I think is going to present in one of these seminars coming up. So I won't take up too much time about this one. But the point I wanted to make about this case is that, yes, it's an environmental case. Yes, it's about damages for uh, a fuel leak, but really it's simply a tort case. It's a negligence case, and it has all of the elements of a normal negligence case, duty, breach, damage. So you don't have to be intimidated. I can't do environmental litigation because you have the basic tools if you know how to run a basic tort case. Um, it also brought up section 50 of the Environment Management Act, which is, uh, has been described as the polluter pays principle. So there is some interesting jurisprudence available to us here in Fiji by using the Environmental Management Act, which does have one or two interesting provisions in it. This is one, um, it's been described as the polluter pays principle, but what it also does and what's really interesting for me, it appears, and we haven't actually got this done judicially yet, but it appears to remove the need for physical damage to claim economic loss. So that is a development on the usual torts that you have to have a physical damage. Um, and this third case that again, as you say, I had a rich client, he was prepared to, uh, uh, to fund these actions. And with this action, we were able to actually challenge the Department of Environment about the processes that they had followed in dealing with an EIA. And actually in this one, we did manage to argue that they hadn't adequately taken into account climate change. Well, it, it tended to be just a, a, one of the many arguments we had with this EIA, because this EIA was actually so 
terrible that it was, it was hard to know when to stop when we were challenging it. But again, it's interesting because we were able to use another interesting section of the Environment Management Act, section 54, which allows any, just about anybody to bring a challenge to anybody who was authorized under the act to carry out a function. So in this case, we said that the director of environment had not properly carried out her functions when considering this EIA and by approving it, and we managed to get this challenge off the ground and successfully got that EIA overturned. Interestingly, it was also one of the cases where we managed to, again, explain to the Department of Environment that EIAs had to be reviewed it was the first time that the Department of Environment had actually set up uh, a committee to review the EIA report. So, you know, there is scope here in Fiji. If you want to use it, you just have to look. Uh, in terms of specific strategic claims, particularly climate change, as far as I'm aware, there have not been any brought so far in the Fiji courts, but there is definitely scope for it. Um, Strategic claims by climate change tend by their very nature to be public interest type of claims. Uh, a little plug for Munro Lees, we've set up a public interest lawyer department. So far it's got one person in it, but it is specifically set up to do public interest litigation claims. So again, if there's anybody out there in Fiji who's like thinking, well, I've got this case, I really don't know how to start, come and see us because this is what we've set this department up to do. To, to litigate on public interest matters. Uh, I think also here in Fiji particularly, but probably also in the Pacific, we need to understand our limitations and I'm not knocking anybody, right? But let's get, let's get real about it. Litigation's not gonna save the environment. I mean, you may be able to chip away, but the litigators and the lawyers by winning cases, we are not gonna save the environment, but we can certainly help. Um, access to environmental justice, is a big issue, but let's be, let's be honest about it again. Here in Fiji, access to justice is a big issue. So if you don't have access to justice, you're unlikely to have access to environmental justice. And that's where we as lawyers need to step in. Because we do have that, I, I believe that duty to try and promote this and use these cases wherever we can. But access to justice, particularly in Fiji at this point in time, is a big issue. Um, moving. All right. uh, this, is my, this is my own personal opinion here, but I think as lawyers, particularly uh, the ones operating in common law judicial systems, we need to understand what it is we're actually getting into, guys. We need to understand the basis of our system. Right? The common law, the English common law, was built around the protection of property rights. Okay. It is designed, it has been designed for hundreds of years to protect property rights. You know, an Englishman's home is a castle. That's where it comes from. So when you step into a court and you're challenging what are often quite nebulous things such as environmental rights, you're actually in a system that wasn't designed for that, doesn't necessarily recognize those, and in fact, in many cases, is actively working against those rights, all right? So we, I could talk for ages about this and I won't, but I think that we need to understand as lawyers that, and we're talking about outside the box think, thinking here, we're working in a system, we have a box already, and that box is designed to do certain things. So we need to be aware of that, and you need to be aware that when you get into these fights for environmental rights, you automatically have one arm tied behind your back. Okay, um, there is, and again, this is my uh, personal interest, uh, and I only talked about the protection of oceans. There is a development uh, about incorporating indigenous belief systems into our legal system. Our current legal system does not readily accommodate that. I question whether or not it ever will because it wasn't designed to do that. And in fact, it's designed, if the truth be told, to exclude them. But I am really interested in this whole new sort of development that seems to be coming on, where we're talking about indigenous belief systems being used to formulate the law and formulate the way that these systems now operate. There's that interesting case in New Zealand where the river itself has now been given legal rights. 
But again, you need to sort of have a look at that case because if you talk to the indigenous yeah. Maori who actually brought this case, you'll find that the indigenous, the, the river itself being given the legal rights was actually part of the compromise that they needed to do with the government lawyers. It wasn't the main thing that they wanted. They wanted recognition of their traditional yeah. belief system. So, a little bit of a side <laughs> Sorry, can I just ask yeah. everybody else except for Nick to mute, please? Thank you. Sorry, Hello. I'm used to being heckled, but I usually Hello? see my heckler. <laughs> At the moment, uh, we cannot see any video. We are only able to access the audio. Hello? Hello? Cannot access to video at the moment. I cannot see anything at all. And I just only able to access to. <laughs> okay, after that brief interlude. <clears throat> Next one. Okay. So coming back to more practical things, funding. You know, even a very basic challenge to the most simple regulatory decision, it's going to be costly. So, I mean, access to justice, if you, you can't really talk about it unless you're talking about the ability to, to fund the litigation. So where is that money going to come from? As I say, I've been fortunate. I had a, a, a client who was prepared to pay and allowed us to take these cases. Um, but you always need to look about where you're going to get the money from, particularly if you're looking at using some sort of strategic litigation. Climate change cases sort of spring to mind. Um, so we, we need to work out where we can get the funding for this. Because ultimately, if you're going to against, use some sort of strategic litigation, you're likely to be up against you know, some big corporate and they have plenty of money. Um, and it's a system, as I say, it's stacked against you and they're not going to muck around. They're going to get the best lawyers and they're going to throw everything at you. So again, we need to know where we're going to get our funding from. And we're going to need to know that it's going to be sufficient to see us through to the end of this piece of litigation. Even if you get lawyers working on a pro bono basis, you're still going to need expert evidence. You're still going to need a significant amount of funding. So that's a, a big issue, just a practical, but it's a big issue. Conflicts of interest, right. I wanted to talk a little bit about this because I'm not sure it's often recognized, but I think um, we do need to sort of talk about it. So let's use Fiji as an example, all right? Fiji is a small island state. Uh, it has big environmental ambitions uh, and I'm not knocking them ambitions at all. But the reality is as a small island state, we need revenue, we need revenue even more so now because of COVID. And those ambitions can easily be diverted by the allure of the dollar. So what do I mean by that? Well, let me just give you one example and I may be, I may be speaking out of turn here and if I am, I'm happy to be corrected. But Fiji recently released uh, a climate change bill, which I think is still going through various iterations. But inside that bill, there was a section that talked about 
a moratorium on deep sea mining, which I thought was very good. But when you got into the detail, you saw that the moratorium didn't include the part of the continental shelf, which is where most of the deep sea mining will take place, because that's where the minerals are. So that's been pointed out in the, in the draft by more than just me. Uh, and it remains to be seen whether or not that was a mistake or whether that was a deliberate omission because the danger with DSM is that it does promise big dollars. Uh, I think the other issue that we have here in Fiji, and this is, a this is a fact of life, and I think it's because of the environment that we're all operating in, but lawyers generally have fallen out of the habit of challenging government decisions. There's two reasons for that. One, I think we're all at least a little bit kowtowed. And secondly, the, there's been a raft of legislation that's been passed over the last 10 years that have removed our ability to challenge government. So, you know, judicial review, which used to be a real, a real hotbed of litigation here in Fiji, that has to all intents and purposes died. There's hardly ever see a, a judicial review case these days. Interesting enough, you could probably still bring a JR under the Environment Management Act, which was a MAC passed in 2010. Uh, then the reality again in Fiji is that if you do win a case, uh, and from my experience with the Fiji Environmental Law Association, this was a very real thing. There was reluctance to bring cases against the government because we were aware that that law could easily be changed if you actually used it and inflicted a defeat upon them. So these issues are real issues. But I think as lawyers, particularly in Fiji, we all just need to get a little bit braver. We all just need to start bringing these cases and seeing what happens. And I admit that that is difficult. Some cases you will not even get through the registry door, never mind getting to see the court. Okay. Um, and then, of course, if you do bring a case and you're trying to bring a case because you want to prove a point or you want to get some definition or ruling on the law, you've got to be aware that that may not well be in the best interests of your client. I mean, for instance, if you're bringing a strategic piece of litigation against a big corporation and you want a ruling from that case which says they have damaged, they've breached section 12 or whatever it is, and then that corporation then offers your client a big sum, sum of money, what's your client's best interest? Obviously the client will probably say, I want the money. So you take the money, but you don't get the ruling in respect of the court case. So these, I think these are things that we just have to be aware of because it's happened. I mean, it happened to me in the Renandi cases. I wanted to take them all the way through and get rulings. But in the end of the day, we ended up settling by way of consent orders because we got what we needed and the client wasn't prepared to reject those offers. So those are, you know, that's just another Another example of there can be even conflicts of interest within the same side. Here in Fiji, that becomes even more complicated, for instance, if you're working for landowners, because as we all know, the landowners, although they're supposed to be one homogenous whole, quite frequently they're not. And it just takes one member of that Matangali to dissent, and all of a sudden you've got an issue about what's going on. So these are issues here in Fiji that we, we need to be aware of. Um, Next slide. Then the, the other area, of course, is that we need to be aware. Um, and I'd like to give a shout out to Fiji Environmental Law Association here, because I think it does a good job on raising awareness about what the systems are, particularly out for the uh, rural communities. Because um, with the best will in the world, the environmental impact assessment process is a relatively complicated process. Public planning is a complicated process. They're not things that are easily understood. So when communities are confronted with these processes, they may take part in a process. I've had cases where they didn't even realize they were taking part in the process. Or they didn't even realize that they'd been consulted because it's not widely understood, okay? And awareness is vital because quite often one of the challenges to an EIA can be that the consultation was inadequate 
but quite often you find in actual fact that consultation process has taken place but the community didn't really understand what it was all about and that box has been ticked so they're not aware what it means they're not aware it's even happened and half the time certainly they're not aware that these things can be challenged they don't understand that they might actually have the ability to go on and challenge these decisions in courts and then even when they are we then come back to all of our other problems as well so to stop being such a pessimist uh, I thought I would just at the end here try and highlight some opportunities okay so we do have an environmental tribunal that's a relatively recent development even though the environment management act has been in place since 2005 hasn't really come into being for until the last 12 months, 18 months. And then we had a hiatus when we lost our tribunal, but he is back now. So there is the possibility to bring cases before him, mainly on appeal. Uh, there's also, as I talked about earlier, these two really interesting sections in the Environment Management Act <coughs> that I think everybody should be aware of. Consider them when you think about possibly bringing a case. So we could use section 50, for instance, to challenge government policies and whether or not those policymakers have taken into account sufficiently climate change um, considerations. Um, and it also allows you, as I say, slightly more easy, easily to access compensation. That court of appeal case that I talked about, the case was sent back to the master for the assessment of damages. So we need to see what sort of damages come out of that. Um, and that will be interesting because it will sort of give us an idea of what the court thinks environmental damage should be. Although it's probably a little bit more commercial than that because that was a garage that was claiming for loss of income. Um, and as I say, we're de people are describing that as a polluter pays principle, which it is, but I think is, there's some more nuances to it than that. And I'm, I'm really interested to see if we can develop this thing that you don't necessarily have to have any physical damage to be able to claim economic loss because that is a rigged move. And then as I say, section 54, that again allows us to challenge people who are authorized by statute to carry out a decision and that they have not, or they fail to take into account some other areas that they should have done. So it's, a, it's almost a judicial review, but it's a judicial review by another name. Um, and then we do, and I'm not, I've got, I haven't got this down on the slide, but then we do have opportunities for some environmental rights um, litigation using our constitutional rights and possibly our constitutional redress. But we just need to get a bit creative about that and get some people into the room and think about how we can do it. I don't think the how's too hard, it's getting the means behind it to do it, the funding and finding the plaintiffs who are prepared to do this. And again, you know, I hate to say this guys, but we're living in an environment here in Fiji where the population is generally if not scared, certainly a little bit reluctant to put their head above the parapet. And that is a problem for litigation and that's a problem for developing the law generally here in Fiji. But to finish on a bright note, there are opportunities. Uh, and as lawyers, I think we're uniquely placed to, to develop those opportunities. So if anybody has anything, I'm more than keen to talk to you offline and see if we can get some cases going because we need to do it guys. Thank you. It's my question. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Barnes. Um, so that was a roller coaster of uh, positive, negative, and positive again. So I'm quite pleased and hopeful at the same time. I have a, a few questions uh, from those watching on Zoom. Um, so I'll just uh, go through those questions uh, first, and it might give our audience uh, here in Silver some time to formulate some really pressing questions. Um, the first one is from uh, Barbara Mali Mali um, on, I think it was uh, to you, Bryony, and you might have covered it just a, a bit on your slide, but she just wanted to know more about the recent Court of Appeal case in the Solomon Islands. Uh, so the decision has not been released. I've only seen uh, a press release about it and I have a copy of the lower instance 
somewhere in the big pile of papers sitting in front of me. <laughs> uh, so it's on Packley, the lower instance case. Um, sorry, I just have it here somewhere. Uh, so the, the lower instance case is, 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 uh, is actually very short uh, and it's really about the capacity of the plaintiffs to seek relief um, where there had been a breach of a statutory obligation simply because the um, defendants had harvested to be logs from their land um, and that was illegal. So it was about saying, okay, there's illegal behavior whilst the defendants had a license to harvest timber, they didn't have a license to harvest these logs and there has been this damage. So it's, it's based on um, a, tortious, a tortious claim uh, and so the damages were calculated based on that. And I'm just looking to see. So that's, that, that's it's very short, like it's, you know, it's Thank a short you. decision. Thank you. Um, I'm sure we'll share the link uh, amongst the other links once we get it. Um, the next question is uh, for Nicholas Barnes. You have uh, four questions. <laughs> Um, from uh, Barbara is what about the consultations of the various uh, constitutions of the various Pacific countries? Couldn't they be used to accommodate indigenous belief systems? Yep, not arguing with that, but I still think to a certain extent you're using, you're trying to squeeze those indigenous belief systems into a system that was developed with something else in mind. I'm not saying it's impossible. And actually, it's a good point, Barbara. I wanted to put a bit of a shout out here. This is where we really need the Indigenous lawyers to step up because I'm not Indigenous and I don't have an intrinsic understanding of these systems and how they work. And we need lawyers who do understand those systems and also understand the system that they're working in to be able to bring these cases properly. So it's, it, it is a real shout out to Indigenous lawyers to sort of get, get up and not be worried that you can't bring these claims because you're the guys that should push this, not some white fella working for a commercial firm. <laughs> but I, um, do you mind if I just add sure, to that sure. just, just yeah. briefly? Because we looked at constitutional rights in our series of reports. So constitutional litigation around indigenous rights is a bit tougher and we haven't seen as much of it. So some of the better, um, Litigation tends to be in your human rights bodies um, or the international human rights bodies. Across the Pacific, most countries have a state directive that directs the state to protect and uphold constitution, uh, sorry, cultural identity. So by extension, that would cover uh, indigenous rights. Um, the trick is to be able to argue that you can connect to that obligation to an existing constitutional right. So you'd have to look at um, litigation from places like India where they've taken the constitutional right to life and they've extended it to other rights in their constitution. So it is challenging, but that would be a useful way to pursue that kind of litigation is to find out where the constitutional rights are and argue that this existing constitutional right to life um, that as a member of an Indigenous community, indeed, you can't have a right to life unless your Indigenous systems can be protected and uphold, which is the state's obligation. So that's just an idea around that, that question. Um, Justice M. Beng, would you like to share or shall we move on to the next question? Um, no, not much, but except to, except to comment that the Indian jurisprudence is very interesting for most of us. Uh, Papua New Guinea, we followed what they call the sewer motto principle, which is a judge acting on his own motion. Uh, and so the kind of cases that are coming from India have been inspiring for our judiciary. And uh, we, we take on a couple of uh, lead from there. It's a question of how you interpret one constitutional provision or a statute. Fortunately for Papua New Guinea, we are mandated to give a fair, large and liberal meaning to provisions using the constitution and any other act of parliament. So uh, that's a privileged position for Papua New Guinea, but whether judges have been able to do that is another question, but on the majority of cases they have, and um, hopefully the Pacific Island countries uh, 
lawyers may need to be creative around seeing what, if any, space opportunities there amongst their uh, constitutions and statutes to see if they can ask for a purposive, fair, large liberal uh, meaning to be given. Thank you, Justice M. Bang. I have uh, another two questions for Nic uh, Nicholas Barnes. And if you, um, Bryony and Justice M. Bang would also like to comment on it afterwards. Um, the question, the first one of the two is, do you think that uh, constitutional environment rights provisions can redress some of the disadvantages in litigating for environment, environmental matters? This is from Georgina Lloyd from UNEP. So do you think that constitutional environment rights provisions can redress some of the disadvantages in litigating for environmental matters? I thought it was a free lunch, obviously not. Uh, look, that's really hard to answer in the abstract. I mean, uh, in principle, yes, but we need to know exactly what we're talking about to give a, a more definitive answer. But yeah, look, there is scope there, definitely, to use these constitutional rights. Um, but as I say, I can, other than just a general answer, there are principles around, from around the world that could be picked up and used, but I can't really give more detail than that because I don't know what, exactly what we're talking about. And I'm not a constitutional rights expert either. <laughs> Maybe I could comment. Yes. Uh, in the human rights uh, space, uh, the Supreme Court in Papua New Guinea has spoken in terms of the court appointing lawyers to advance human rights cases. In the case, for instance, if I initiate a you know, environment uh, rights based claim, uh, I could then engage a lawyer who I could order for is cost to be covered in a certain way. That's yet to happen. But as uh, Nick says, it is possible. In the abstract, we say it's possible. Real cases will uh, enable us to get some practical lessons and move forward. So if I could um, add to those comments, uh, obviously there are some issues around the Pacific that um, you know local lawyers understand better than me, but what has been effective in jurisdictions in Asia, so particularly South Asia, is that litigants have used constitutional uh, writs, writs petitions. And what that does is it leapfrogs over the lower jurisdictions. So you can go straight to a, a court of a higher oh, jurisdiction. Court. So that means that you're not fighting it out in the district court and then go up and up and up and up. You can go straight to the Supreme Court uh, and depending on the structure of your rules of procedure, sometimes those are matters that can be heard on the papers and they can be heard very quickly. And mm -hmm. as Justice Ambeng mentioned, Supreme Courts can often be um, much more creative in their orders. So I was talking um, to a judge from India and she was saying, you know, in the use of experts, um, they make much more creative orders about asking the party with the deeper pockets to pay mm -hmm. for the costs of the expert so that makes it that there's some cost benefits for um, applicants and then um, this is an aside it's not constitutional but if you have relaxed rules of standing so the philippines has a relaxed sorry a, a special rules of procedure for environmental matters and that would allow you to bring a constitutional case but it has it reverses the onus of proof for some kinds of matters. So you can seek a TIPA, a tem temporary environmental protection order. Um, and you just have to prove, you just have to show that the damage is there. And then the onus is on the respondent to show why the order should not stay in place. And so you, there's some sort of tricks that can be done, but coming back to the original question, yes, that would be one of the advantages of constitutional litigation. I'm not saying it's easy, but you can leapfrog to a court of higher jurisdiction. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to uh, put it back to Georgina Lloyd, who initially asked this question and hopefully it was answered to your satisfaction. Thank you, Maria. That was great. Thank you, all of the respondents. Um, the next question I have is for all the presenters uh, in speaking about access to justice. This is from Nicholas Sadu, who I can see is also a 
top there. Um, so access to justice, which he interpreted as having easy access to courts, legal and environmental resources, is a rights-based approach to a dispute, which I agree has a place in resolving issues in the dispute. However, what steps are being taken to resolve environmental and climate related disputes through mediation, where the interests of all parties, traditional and indigenous rights values can be considered and together they work on a resolution. This is far cheaper as a means of access to justice than spending thousands of dollars on litigation. So I'll put it to Nick. Please. Well, that's an easy question, Nick, in Fiji, no. <laughs> uh, in Fiji, ADR is a bit of an alien concept all around to our uh, legal profession. It's something that is gaining some ground, but it's certainly not something that uh, automatically pops into my colleagues' heads. I mean, ADR is, is, is becoming more, more, more often, if, if you could say, but certainly I, not seen it being used in an environmental context yet. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll quickly add, I think that's where you have the benefit of, of, of uh, engaging with different jurisdictions. So um, Chief Justice Brian Preston of the New South Wales Land and Environment Court would have a lot to say about that. I have to say we didn't cover mediation in our reports. It's harder to cover mediation because it's not something that gets reported. But I think it's really an issue for courts um, can set up, I agree, um, mediation is much faster, it's much quicker and it's consensus-based agreement, everybody agrees. Uh, it's a matter of setting the structure up and enabling it to happen. And I would think that in the age of COVID where courts are going online, it does, allow parties to come together quickly because you don't have people that need to fly together. So maybe we can see that as an advantage for, at this particular time. So it's just an issue of setting it up in a different jurisdiction and working in different, with different, different jurisdictions that have done so. Um, Justice Mbang? Yeah, if I could pick up from there. Sure. Yes, uh, in Papua New Guinea, mediation is now well entrenched for, for the judiciary. We have um, ADR division fully functional with uh, conference facilities, uh, several staff, about seven or eight of them. Uh, and then we have two judges who are trained accredited mediators, Justice Shepard and myself. Uh, we have done a number of mediation on location, but not strictly on the environment, law, climate change area, but this is resource-based uh, disputes, oil and gas uh, extraction, forestry, uh, big and customary land-based ones, where it is impossible to get the real um, indigenous people or the customary landowning group uh, into the courtroom. The process by mediation has gone to location, facilitators, parties, lawyers, everybody camp out and that we've uh, successfully del delivered a large number of cases where the real people participating. You know, it's a complicated process, but uh, when you do it, it uh, helps and everybody participates. It serves two purposes. One is to check if the person who's coming to court has the permission authority of everybody and is doing for the interest of everybody in, in the community that he purports to represent. The other is it gives, if he's, if he's acting for and on behalf of everyone, it gets endorsed right up and there's no issue as to representing. And then the uh, aggressor or the um, party, defending party is made to then sit down and talk through the issue with the people. And we have a complicated process, sometimes one month, sometimes two months, sometimes one week. It has happened, it is happening uh, in the environment and the climate change area. I do not see any change in that when large groups of people are involved. We may be able to take uh, people ADR process to location with our um, satellite rollout and also the integrated case management system I was talking about. One of the checkpoints will be, have you gone to mediation? If they've gone to mediation, there'll be a tick and that progresses to litigation pathway. If they hadn't gone to, then the mediation will be the first checkpoint. Presently, before the rules come in, we are doing directions and uh, empowering people to talk settlement within 
certain time frame, less than a month or so. If that does not work, come back with draft orders for mediation. So after mediation, if the court is persuaded that there's an issue for trial, that's for every case, every civil case, uh, they will go to trial. So that's already part of our system. It is being implemented and we try to be, the, be, be more proactive. The system will eventually allow for no filing of cases unless people have tried mediation first. Or if they hadn't, then mediation first before litigation probably completes. M Tasso. <laughs> Thank you, Justice Sembe. Um, the next question I have uh, is from, are there, sorry, are there any questions in the room here in Sudan? Sorry, the Environmental Mediation Tribunal. What is its role in Fiji? Is it for ADR or is it? No, what? The, the Environmental Tribunal is set up primarily for appeals from decisions on EIAs by the Department of Environment. That's its primary role. It's an appeal court from the Department of Environment. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, uh, Nicholas uh, Sadu, were you satisfied with the answers that came through to your question? Um, yes, I was, I'm aware that the, the issue of um, ADR is still while they've got the mediation center, um, the uptake of mediation is probably still a bit behind in Papua New Guinea where I'm aware but um, it's it's something that I think uh, from an environmental perspective I think would be very encouraging because the issues they are interest-based and where you can solve <laughs> issues of what is actually affecting the people of the land rather than leaving mm -hmm. it to a rights base where the issue and you get a, a, a damage or a quantum but may not pass down and may not satisfy the interest mm -hmm. so, yeah it'd be interesting to see what um, how much Nick can um, keep pushing that in through Fiji and the Pacific. I think his honor is doing quite well in Papua New Guinea. Uh, well, trying, trying. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Uh, the next question I have is from Sandeep Lau. Uh, it was to Mr. Nicholas once again. Um, <laughs> so should councils put the safety and well-being of the environment over the interests of their clients in the private sector? If regulatory bodies are not equipped to handle the complex nature of applications, do we push away, push our way forward for our clients or stand up and defend the environment? Are you a plant? <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a really interesting ethical dilemma. I mean, the short answer to that is that you are supposed to work in the best interests of your client. So that, that's where it becomes hard. If your client's wanting one thing and you, you've brought a piece of litigation with a specific aim in mind, um, you may not be able to achieve that aim if your client wants to go down another route. So I, I'd be very reluctant to say, no, I ignored my client and I'd probably quickly get sacked in any event. So ethically, uh, and let, as long as we're not doing anything illegal or misleading the court, I don't think we can push the environment's rights above what the interests of the client are. Hopefully the two are aligned, but as I say, that's not always the case. Mm. Sorry, yeah, Justice and then did you want to contribute to that question as well? I think Nick's, I concur with Nick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank God for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, that seems to be all the questions I have. Um, Sorry, I have a few more questions, comments. Um, for, for Briny, the, I think, I'm not sure who this comment came from. The Framheim case considers international agreements um, like UNCLOS. So it's useful if you want to look at a Pacific New Zealand approach to international rights. You can apply this in the indigenous rights context. Framheim also looks at customary rights in the fisheries context. Yeah, that was just me responding to a comment. Uh, oh, okay. Me yeah, sorry. I was just adding to another comment that somebody had asked in the, in the comments. Okay, so um, 
the next one was, I'm assuming now, is from Puebla, Kampu. Uh, Fiji Mediation Center was set up by the former Chief Justice of Fiji. The structure in place, however, as Mr. Barnes said, the momentum is still yet to be engaged by lawyers. Um, mediation cases brought forward are commercial in nature and small land tenure types involving TLTB, uh, which is our um, uh, Native Land Trust Board or Itoke Land Trust Board. However, it's not on serious environmental or climate space issues. That was just a comment that was shared. Is, did anyone want to speak to that comment or? No. Is there uh, any other questions that we have or comments or they'd like to share their experiences from whichever jurisdiction they're from? Hi, this is Alison Cole speaking and I'm a senior lecturer in Hong Kong, but also in New Zealand. I had written a question in there and maybe I could just read it. Um, just asking everybody, please, your experience of courts awarding costs against uh, public interest litigants. Um, and if there is any way that, you know, we can uh, draw on the special status being a public interest litigant so that we uh, have our pro bono um, efforts recognized and not have costs uh, awarded against us. If there is any jurisprudence or precedent that you might be aware of, um, I know some jurisdictions like in the United States support that. Uh, but at least in the jurisdictions where I'm active, this is a massive deterrent. Um, and even though it's great to, you know, be called to arms and bring these cases, if you're having to pay out of pocket, um, not just your own free labor, then that can be quite scary. Well, in Fiji, public interest litigation is not uh, well recognized. It doesn't happen a great deal. Um, I worked in public interest litigation in the UK and we were, we did manage to persuade the courts to be uh, lenient on cost orders because of that. Quite often the courts recognize that. So there is jurisprudence around, you know, English jurisprudence could be used in Fiji and probably most of the Pacific Island uh, nations. But specifically speaking from Fiji, I haven't seen a great deal of public interest litigation. So it's not an issue that's come forward just yet. Um, funny enough, costs are not usually a big problem here in Fiji. Our cost orders are a bit paltry. So it wouldn't necessarily be the cost order that would be the worry. It would actually just be funding the litigation to start with. Yeah, that's, I think it's, a, it's such a good question uh, and costs uh, often hard to see in any decision. So you have to be involved in the matter. There are jurisdictions around Asia, which uh, recognize where, particularly in these big public interest constitutional matters, where it's, a, it's not vexatious and it's a really serious matter that's in the public interest. They would be, as Nick said, much more lenient on costs. Um, so there are examples, and I can't think of any off the top of my head, from around Asia. Um, again, I think it comes back to this issue of procedures and how courts can make uh, litigation more cost effective for uh, anyone pursuing matters uh, because it is an issue. One other thing that I do want to raise is um, it's a world of social media and connection. So as much as we're disconnected, there's a lot of people around the world who have a similar goal and who, if you connect with some of the good quality legal NGOs are willing to provide support. Now I'm not touting this and I certainly don't have experience, but it is worth considering that it is, you know, um, there are connections that can be made with um, NGOs who do this litigation around the world that could provide that expertise um, Client Earth is one um, NGO that does a lot, they do a lot of, in the climate space. Uh, so it would be interesting to just have a look at that and they, they might have some more information. Um, Justice Anbang, did you want yes. to? 
Yeah, um, in, uh, thank you, Maria. In PNG, we do have the Public Solicitor's Office, which is the we defense the uh, people who cannot af afford legal fees. Their focus has been on criminal cases, but in recent times, they've moved into civil areas as well. Some of the officers are appearing in civil cases. Uh, and so hopefully, but the only problem that is one of resourcing, they are usually under-resourced and you don't necessarily get the best lawyer possible in some of these cases. So that's a challenge that the country has to overcome. But in the constitutional law arena, the course order experience has been that each party has been ordered in most cases to bear their own costs because of the constitutional questions presented in the public interest uh, part of the case. In the environmental law space, hopefully one test case might have to come and the uh, questions may have to be put to the Supreme Court one of these days and I look forward to that opportunity. Thank you. Um, are there any questions from the room? Yes. Thank you, yes. Um, very quickly, um, Marina Levy from SIP. Uh, we work uh, closely with the uh, 38 community partners and the Extractive is also one of our core work stream. Um, maybe just want to quickly share that at the moment we are working on a, a community booklet, which we aim to educate our communities with, and this is to be translated into vernacular, because just to address the challenge our communities have in terms of understanding environmental laws and existing compliance mechanisms. Um, I think part of the processes when we were doing uh, interviews with the stakeholders is that we found out um, that when communities are experiencing or seeing changes on the ground, um, they, they can deal with MRD or Mineral Resources uh, Department. So um, when we interviewed um, MRD, they actually shared to us that they only act as uh, mediators. So um, because we want to um, provide information to communities and we also wanted to ensure that the information are factual. I'm more interested to find out um, if we have existing uh, process, if in cases where communities wishes to um, proceed with civil claims. Thank you. Your question to Mr. Banks. Uh, yes, I hope. <laughs> I think I'm uh, interested to know if communities um, are not satisfied with the mediation that are provided by MRD or Mineral Resources Department, if we have an existing uh, process where they can perhaps um, move forward in terms of civil claims, or if we even have a process in place. Uh, I'm interested about that comment about MRD acting as mediators. That's a new one for me. Uh, Look, there are, yeah, there are, there are systems available that challenges can be brought. It's a case of accessing that and working, working it out. So the cases can be challenged. But as of the point I was making before is that quite often what happens is that a community will be involved in a consultation, for instance, for a development, and won't fully understand what that means. And then two and a half years later, they'll come into, into for instance, our office and say, right, we were never consulted. And I immediately go, are you sure about that? And when you do some digging, you find that actually they were consulted and there was quite an extensive consultation process going on. So you, you've just all, particularly with these community groups in, in Fiji, it's a real issue. I just, and I don't know how you address that because it's a big problem. They have to consult. It's a big group of people to consult and obviously people forget or weren't there, didn't understand what it was about. So it, it, is, a, it is a problem. But yes, there are systems available. But quite often, if you're trying to challenge a process, consultation is one of the things you look at, and quite often that box has been ticked because that's what the developers are aware of. They, they know the system, definitely. Briny or Justice Mbang, did you want to contribute to that? Or? Well, just a quick comment. If mediation, if mediation does not result in any settlement, parties should be able to go to litigation, take the issue to the next level. So I'm not really clear about the particular situation in Fiji, but it'll be most surprising if litigation is barred and regardless of the outcome at mediation. Also, if mediation results in an agreement, parties could still go to enforcement if there's 
non-performance uh, of what has been agreed to. Just those are my two comments. Thank you. Uh, I have another question here from, uh, not a question, more so two comments or one comment. Um, Bangladesh's top court granted all the country's rivers the same legal rights as an entity in 2019. Bangladesh became the first country to grant all of its rivers the same legal status as humans. How far are other countries to consider the same? Hmm. I, uh, I've just put in the comments uh, a high court case from India, Atarakhand granted legal status to water bodies and terrestrial ecosystems in a case of Lalit. Uh, there was another case that it did the same. They are on appeal. Uh, so there are jurisdictions that are granting legal status to water bodies. And in that case, the court felt that, felt that there was, um, that rivers had a right to exist, persist, maintain and sustain and regenerate their own vital ecology system India has also recognized the rights of animals to life. So they actively use the constitutional right to life and they extend it to the application uh, in environmental cases. Mm -hmm. um, just in the Philippines uh, had a case where uh, community members tried to extend, um, tried to seek legal standing on behalf of marine mammals and said that they had a right to sue. Um, and ultimately the, the Supreme Court didn't need to make that finding because of their environmental rules of procedure. And they said, citizens have a right to come as legal guardians for nature and to sue. So again, I come back to that comment of the use of uh, rules of procedure that allow citizens to pursue matters on behalf of nature. And yes, um, there are more countries that are granting legal status to nature. Uh, I, and look, so just to give you a bit, a bit of feedback on that, my initial reaction to when I saw those um, rivers were being granted legal entities was fantastic, great. I thought that was a superb thing. However, and I'm not necessarily saying it's a bad thing, but I was sort of surprised when I read into it a bit deeper to see that, as for, for instance, that Maori case, that the Maoris regarded that point as almost an aside, and that was the compromise that they had given to the Crown lawyers in their negotiation. So just picking up on Akinisi's point about, you know, we're not gonna get, solve our problems by using the same thinking. This is the point I was making before about, you know, we're still working within that same box and that same framework. And I'm not necessarily saying that's wrong, but I do think we need to consider outside of that box. And I think this is where possibly the, uh, the indigenous belief systems will need to be considered in more detail because it's just interesting to me that the, the giveaway or the compromise was this is it, okay, yeah, you can have the river as a legal entity. I mean, I, I, I know no more about that. It's just, it was just, wow. It was a completely different way of thinking about things to me. But as lawyers, well, I think we all think, oh, legal entity, great. Thank you. Um, I think the last comments are um, mostly a lot of appreciation from the audience, uh, from Brent, uh, Barbara, sorry, and uh, Mr. Isikeli Mataitanga, who says um, he'd be keen to look at court procedures as an impediment to access to human rights, um, uh, as it's not usually effectively protected by courts in the most specific island countries where the government is the respondent. Um, so I think on that positive note, we'd like to thank you all for joining us uh, this afternoon for this uh, series. Thank you to the speakers for sharing their knowledge and um, my job here is done. So I'll pass it over to my co-moderator, Maria Naka. Thank you, Akanisi, for such a superb job. Well done. <laughs> Um, we're going to close off now and I just wanted to take the opportunity first to thank firstly the presenters to Bryony, to Justice uh, Ambang and to Nicholas Barnes. Thank you so much. We started planning this seminar, it was around end of November, early December, and then touched base again in late June. So I'm, I'm grateful for your support. Um, 
And I acknowledge the I acknowledge ADB uh, through um, both um, Briny Ills and uh, through Iram Asan, who helped us connect with Justice Ambang. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, I'd like also to thank the team here behind the scenes, uh, Noaya, Varea, and Fipe for helping to, um, you know, support the the seminar in the different aspects in IT. Uh, Varea did really well with the questions and providing that to the moderators. Um, just a reminder: this is a lead up to the Oceania Environmental Law Conference, which is um, scheduled for July 2021. We will inform you later on in the month more details about the conference. This seminar is the first of four seminars that we are planning to in the lead up to the seminar, uh, in the, to the conference rather, and to following the conference. A second one is planned for May, um, and that will focus on the polluter pay principal case uh, here in Fiji. So we're gonna dissect that more. And we've invited James Sloan, who has agreed to present in the next seminar, um, although he's all the way in London, I believe. Um, and for the CLE, we will inform everyone in due course once we hear back from the Board of Legal Education on whether they've, they've approved that. I believe that they will approve it. I'm hoping that they will and that you'll get all the CLE points in order for you to get your practicing certificates for, for this year. Um, and with that, um, I thank each and every one of you again, Vinaka uh, Vakalevo for joining us, um, and also to IUCN for allowing the Environmental Law Program to run this seminar. Vinaka, and goodbye. Thank you.